Our lesson this morning is on peace. In our, in our scripture reading, it says, And the effect of the righteousness is quietness and assurance forever. What a great promise we have in God that we can have peace even though on earth we may not have the peace we want, but with God we can have peace with Him and the promise of eternal life. Peace in the Hebrew is salon. And it means to fashion, to achieve a stable condition. And I have put in a lot of toggle boats, and I bet... Cliff has put in more toggle boats than me. But toggle boats hold things in a stable condition and they keep things there. Uh, I, I know that, that that's what, what it is. But to have peace is to have a stable condition. You want peace in the home. You want peace in the world. You want peace at church. We want to be stable. We want to have things on an even keel. The word shalom... Uh, is written like that in the Old Testament. The Old Testament uses Shalom 302 times in 281 verses. That's quite a bit. And it is an important thought, an important concept for us to do, and it has with it the idea of being whole. We're at peace when we are whole. We have a wholeness about us. We have tranquility about us. We have stability, and it stands for spiritual soundness whenever we're at peace with God. God has an eternal plan for peace. And he spoke to Abraham, and he gave Abraham all sorts of information and instructions. But Abraham is known to be the father the great father that there was in the children of Israel, and he had received from God the eternal plan. We find this in Genesis 15, beginning in verse 12. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. Then he said to Abraham, No certainty that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, and they will serve them, and they will afflict them 400 years. We know that this has all come about. It was God's plan, but how did God get it all accomplished? Well, Joseph was the favorite son, and Joseph was jealous. His brothers were jealous, and Joseph was thrown into the pit, and they saw these traitors come from Midian. And they gave them, sold, actually sold Joseph into slavery in Egypt. And in Egypt, things went well for a while, but then there was a problem with Potiphar's wife. He ended up in prison. He ended up interpreting the dream of the baker and butler and told them to remember them. But they kind of forgot it until the king had a dream. And so all these things came about for the saving, according to the book of Genesis, saving of many people. Joseph ended up in Egypt. It was during a famine. His brothers came to him, and he provided for them, and they moved down there to Egypt because Joseph was there, and he invited his dad and his family to come there, and they grew to be a large number of people. So they're, in, they're, they're there for 400 years. And then it says, and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge, and after that they shall come out with great possessions. This is foretold before it happens, and I tell you what, when they leave Egypt, they're given gold, they're given silver, they're given precious, precious jewels, all sorts of bounty are they given, get out of here, our firstborn is dead, go, and they it was foretold that they would leave with great treasures. And that great treasures is going to be used later whenever they build the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, so they, they, this all comes about. It's amazing how God's word comes true. Now as for you, you will go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried at a good old age. So he's going to go to his fathers in peace. Notice that he's going to his fathers. 
something I point out all the time. It's not going to strangers, but he's going to go to be with his fathers. It's going to be in paradise with God. But in the fourth generation they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. So he tells them, all right, we're going to be in bondage 400 years. In the fourth generation they're going to come back here to this promised land, but it's not for right now, it's for later on because the Amorites have still, he's not through with them yet. And so all this is foretold. God has a plan. Number two, under the covenant, peace was achieved through sacrifice. And we find Abraham is tested on this account. He's told to take his only son Isaac and to offer him as a sacrifice on the altar. They go and they go to the mountain and they prepare there and they get there and his son asks, where's the, where's the offering? And he says, God will provide and as he lays Isaac on the altar, as he's there to slay his son, to make the offering, God stays his head. And a ram is caught in the thicket and he's spared. But that proved Abraham's faithfulness in his cares. But in the old law, under the old covenant, they had to offer sacrifices every year. And... It was the important thing that they did, and it says there, when his offering is sacrifice a priest's offering, if he offers it in the hurt, whether it be male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. It wasn't the runt of the litter that you took to offer to the Lord. It was your very best. One without spot, without blemish. It was a perfect sacrifice that was made for to atone the people of their sins. That was the peace offering. And Jesus is the perfect sacrifice that was offered for us so that we can have eternal life. And he has offered it once for all. So we don't have to offer these sacrifices. Then in 1 Samuel 15 and 22, it says, So Samuel said, Has the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to heed than the fat of rams. He's pointing towards a time when it would be known that, 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 that we would have the word of God in our hearts, we would obey him, but he's always wanted our obedience more than sacrifice. But sacrifices was during the time of the Old Testament, and that's how they related to God. In Psalms 34 and verse 14, depart from evil, and do good, seek peace, and pursue it. You can't have peace in the midst of evil. So you've got to depart from evil to have peace. You depart evil, that's still true today, you depart from evil to have seek to do good, and you've got to seek peace and you've got to pursue it. It is something to be pursued. And... In Bible class, I've talked a little bit about the episodes that are on when calls the heart. And I'm about, I saw last week's, just yesterday, and peace was made between the preacher and his brother yesterday. It took quite a bit of time to get that peace made. But to be at peace with all men is something you have to pursue, you have to want, and you have to accomplish it, and it's not always easy but something we should see. Number three, God's plan included his own son. His plan for us to have peace included Christ. Here's a picture of Jesus whenever he was 12 years old. He's in the temple and he's astounding the teachers because he has great knowledge about God and about the things that God would want. And he asks intelligent questions and he expounds upon the word of God. He has an amazing knowledge of the Word of God for a 12-year-old. I believe God was with him in that. But he knew when he came to earth that he had a mission. In Isaiah 9, 6, and 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
That Prince of Peace is what we need. And he's going to enable us to have peace with God so that we can be right with him. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And so it's a foreshadowing or foretelling this prophecy about Christ and they thought it was going to be an earthly kingdom, but it's a heavenly kingdom. And he said that peace will last forever. And we, we know that to be true. Jesus is going to tell us various different things, but in Isaiah 52 and verse 7, it says, How beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of them who bring good news, who proclaim peace, who bring glad tidings of good things, who proclaim salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. And so part of our mission is to bring peace. Bring peace with God. A way to have your sins forgiven that salvation has been prepared through Jesus Christ's death on the cross so we can have everlasting life. We're to proclaim peace. And we're to bring it so that people come to understand the good news of Jesus Christ. And I say 53 and verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement for our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. So he took the penalty that we deserve so that we could have peace with God. He, he took it so there could be peace. And so that we could be healed and in a right relationship with God. Number four, Jesus promised peace. But when we read this, what type of peace is he offering? In John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do, I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither, neither let it be afraid. He says, not as the world gives, but he has a peace that surpasses all sorts of things so that we can have peace. Does Jesus care when my heart is hurting? I love that song. I'm glad we sang it. We only have peace through God. In John 16 and 33, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will be have tribulation. Other translations use the word trouble. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And so in the world, we're not promised that we won't have difficulties. We won't have sorrows. We won't have hard days. But he said, be of good cheer. He's overcome the world. And he is the one that gives us the peace that we need. Number five, Jesus justifies us through his blood and gives us peace with God. That blood is the most important thing. We've got to be washed in the blood of the lambs in the waters of baptism. But that blood symbolizes our peace, our peace with God. In Romans 5, 1 through 9, Therefore, having been justified by grace, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God, and not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulations produce perseverance. And perseverance, character, and character, hope. Now hope does not disappoint it because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us for when we were still without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He paid the penalty so that we could have everlasting life. He's the one who establishes peace through his death. Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath through him. 
So Jesus shedding his blood on the cross gives us eternal life. It gives us that hope where we can be saved and we're justified by the blood of Christ when we contact them in the waters of baptism. In Hebrews 13, 20 and 21, Now by the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. That blood of Christ is the everlasting covenant, the promise that he would provide the way so that we could have direct access to the Father. And what happened when he died? The veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom, giving us access to God. There's a scene in the Bible where Jesus is sleeping. And everything about him is in turmoil. I mean, the water is just tumultuous. And his disciples are even thinking they might die. And Jesus is asleep. And they go and wake him and said, we perish, we perish. Uh, it's, it's terrible out here. We're, 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 we're afraid for our lives. And Jesus says, peace, be still. And lo and behold, the waters became calm. And he tells his disciples, you know, that they got to believe in him and trust him. And they say, who is this man that even the winds and the sea obey him? Well, Jesus is the author of peace, and he offers us that peace today. He's given us a roadmap to heaven. John 8, 24 says, I told you that you would die in your sins if you do not believe that I am the one I claim to be. You will indeed die in your sins. So we first of all note that we've got to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And then he tells us to repent. I tell you no, but unless you repent, you too will all likewise, uh, the version that I learned, likewise perish. And I think that that's important, that we've got to repent. Repentance is turning away from evil and towards God. we got to confess Christ before me, and whoever acknowledges me before men, I will... Also acknowledge him before my Father who is in heaven. And then we've got to be baptized. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so it's for the forgiveness of sins that we are baptized into Christ so that we can know what God would want us to do and and. We teach others that this is what they ought to do. And then it says, remain faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. That's the road map to heaven. If you want peace with God, you follow that plan. And if you have a need today, won't you come while together we stand and sing.